Section zero of A General View of Positivism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A General View of Positivism by Auguste Comte. Translated by John Henry Bridges. Introduction and Introductory Remarks. Republic of the West. Order and Progress A General View of Positivism, or Summary Exposition of the System of Thought and Life Adapted to the Great Western Republic, formed of the five advanced nations, the French, Italian, Spanish, British, and German, which, since the time of Charlemagne, have always constituted a political whole. Reorganisé sans Dieu ni roi, par le culte systématique de l'humanité. Nul ne doit qu'à faire son devoir. L'esprit doit toujours être le ministre du cours et jamais son esclave. Reorganization, irrespectively of God or King, by the worship of humanity, systematically adopted. Man's only right is to do his duty. The intellect should always be the servant of the heart and should never be its slave by Auguste Comte, author of System of Positive Philosophy, Paris, 1848. Introduction by Frederick Harrison Although positivism has been pretty widely discussed of late, not only by those interested in philosophy and religion, but by the general reader and the public press, perhaps but few of them, whether readers or critics, have exactly grasped the full meaning of it as a system at once of thought and of life. The vast range of ground it covers in the technical, elusive, and close style of Comte's writings in the original have made it difficult to master the subject as a whole. It has accordingly been thought that the time has come to add to the new universal library a translation of the general view of positivism, i.e. the careful summary of the positive polity which Auguste Comte prefixed to the four volumes of his principal work. The translation, which was published by Dr. J. H. Bridges in 1865, is at the same time a most accurate version by one of Comte's earliest followers, and also it is turned in an easy and simpler style, with the references and allusions explained, marginal headings to the paragraphs, and a complete analysis of the contents. Positivism is not simply a system of philosophy, nor is it simply a new form of religion, nor is it simply a scheme of social regeneration. It partakes of all of these and professes to harmonize them under one dominant conception that is equally philosophic and social. Its primary object, writes Comte, is twofold, to generalize our scientific conceptions and to systematize the art of social life. Accordingly, Comte's ideal embraces the three main elements of which human life consists, thoughts, feelings, and actions. Now it is clear that no such comprehensive system was ever before offered to the world. Neither the gospel nor any known type of religion undertook to give a synthetic grouping of the sciences. No synthetic scheme of philosophy ever attempted to correlate religion, politics, art, and industry. No system of socialism, ancient or modern, started with mathematics and led up to an ideal of human devotion to duty, with a ritual of worship, both public and private. Now Comte's famous positive polity did attempt this gigantic task, and the novelty and extent of such a work explains and accounts for the extreme difficulty met with by readers of the original French, and also for the fascination which it has maintained more than fifty years after the author's death. It has been talked about, criticized, even ridiculed, with an ignorance of its true character which can only be excused by the abstract and severe form in which Comte thought right to condense his thoughts. Comte was primarily a mathematician, and neither Descartes nor Newton troubled themselves about the general reader. Kepler, they said, declared himself satisfied if he had one convert in a century, and philosophers have seldom had justice done them until some generations have passed. The difficulties presented by the scientific form of Comte's works have been obviated for English readers by the versions of his English followers, which are at once literal translations, analyses, and elucidations. 
For the general reader, nothing could be more serviceable than Bridges' clear presentation of Comte's own general view, or summary of his system. The translation itself is a literary masterpiece. It renders an extremely abstract and complex French type of philosophical dogmatism into easy and simple English, whilst at the same time preserving and even elucidating the somewhat cryptic allusions and nuances of the original. The thought in the French is full, pregnant, and suggestive, at once subtle and abstract, and rich with words of a new coinage, such as altruism, sociology, dynamics, i.e. history, and old words used in a special sense. This difficulty Dr. Bridges surmounts by breaking up the involved sentences, supplying names and facts indirectly referred to, and by transferring technical language into popular English. The success of the translation has been proved by the thousands of copies sold in the original duodecimo edition of 1865, in the octavo edition of 1875, and in the stereotyped reprint of 1881. A pathetic interest attaches to the history of the translation. In 1860, Dr. Bridges, just settled as a physician in Melbourne, lost his young wife by fever. He at once returned to England, bringing the remains of his wife for internment in the family graveyard in Suffolk. In those days of sailing vessels, the voyage home round Cape Horn occupied at least three months. Dr. Bridges resolved to conquer his sorrow, shut himself in the cabin during the voyage home, and completed the translation in 430 pages of print within the time at sea. The sad mechanic exercise, like dull narcotics numbing pain. Auguste Comte always spoke of the positive polity as his principal work. The Discours sur l'ensemble, or general view of positivism, formed the introduction to the four volumes. It forms a summary of the entire work, and is indeed a systematic application of the doctrine to the actual condition of society. As the polity, taken as a whole, professes to embody a set of doctrines for the regulation of thought and life, the present introduction is designed to show the need of such a body of doctrine, the result that they would produce, and the mode in which they are likely to work. Thus, one who desires to see in one view the social purpose which positivism proposes to effect would find it in no single volume better than in this treatise. The work consists of six chapters, treating positivism respectively in its intellectual aspect, its social aspect, its influence on the working classes, on women, on art, and on religion. In other words, it illustrates the application of the system to philosophy, politics, industry, the family, poetry, and the future. It opens with a comparison of positivist doctrines with those of the leading extant philosophies. It closes with a picture of society should those doctrines be realized. It is thus both a criticism of current theories and a utopia of a possible future. Of the intermediate chapters, the first deals with the principal changes proposed in our actual political system. The next chapter deals with the changes proposed in our present social system. Then come the last two chapters, dealing with the principal agents, art, poetry, and religion, by which those changes may be promoted. This book is therefore a practical introduction to the subject as a whole, for it sets forth the aim of positivism as a system, and then how it seeks to affect that aim. A General View of Positivism We tire of thinking, and even of acting. We never tire of loving. In the following series of systematic essays upon positivism, the essential principles of the doctrine are first considered. I then point out the agencies by which its propagation will be affected, and I conclude by describing certain additional features indispensable to its completeness. My treatment of these questions will, of course, be summary, yet it will suffice, I hope, to overcome several excusable but unfounded prejudices. It will enable any competent reader to assure himself that the new general doctrine aims at something more than satisfying the intellect, that it is in reality quite as favorable to feeling and even to imagination. Introductory Remarks Positivism consists essentially of a philosophy and a polity. These can never be dissevered, the former being the basis and the latter the end of one comprehensive system, in which our intellectual faculties and our social sympathies are brought into close correlation with each other. 
For, in the first place, the science of society, besides being more important than any other, supplies only the logical and scientific link by which all our varied observations of phenomena can be brought into one consistent whole. Of this science it is even more true than of any of the preceding sciences, that its real character cannot be understood without explaining its exact relation in all general features with the art corresponding to it. Now here we find a coincidence which is assuredly not fortuitous. At the very time when the theory of society is being laid down, an immense sphere is opened for the application of that theory. The direction, namely, of the social regeneration of Western Europe. For, if we take another point of view, and look at the great crisis of modern history as its character is displayed in the natural course of events, it becomes every day more evident how hopeless is the task of reconstructing political institutions without the previous remodeling of opinion and of life. To form, then, a satisfactory synthesis of all human conceptions is the most urgent of our social wants, and it is needed equally for the sake of order and of progress. During the gradual accomplishment of this great philosophical work, a new moral power will arise spontaneously throughout the West, which, as its influence increases, will lay down a definite basis for the reorganization of society. It will offer a general system of education for the adoption of civilized nations, and by this means will supply in every department of public and private life fixed principles of judgment and of conduct. Thus the intellectual movement and the social crisis will be brought continually into close connection with each other. Both will combine to prepare the advanced portion of humanity for the acceptance of a true spiritual power, a power more coherent as well as more progressive than the noble but premature attempt of medieval Catholicism. The primary object, then, of positivism is twofold, to generalize our scientific conceptions and to systematize the art of social life. These are but two aspects of one and the same problem. They will form the subjects of the first two chapters of this work. I shall first explain the general spirit of the new philosophy. I shall then show its necessary connection with the whole course of that vast revolution, which is now about to terminate under its guidance in social reconstruction. This will lead us naturally to another question. The regenerating doctrine cannot do its work without adherence. In what quarter shall we hope to find them? Now, with individual exceptions of great value, we cannot expect the adhesion of any of the upper classes in society. They are all more or less under the influence of baseless metaphysical theories and of aristocratic self-seeking. They are absorbed in blind political agitation and in disputes for the possession of the useless remnants of the old theological and military system. Their action only tends to prolong the revolutionary state indefinitely and can never result in true social renovation. Whether we regard its intellectual character or its social objects, it is certain that positivism must look elsewhere for support. It will find a welcome in those classes only whose good sense has been left unimpaired by our vicious system of education, and whose generous sympathies are allowed to develop themselves freely. It is among women, therefore, and among the working classes that the heartiest supporters of the new doctrine will be found. It is intended, indeed, ultimately for all classes of society, but it will never gain much real influence over the higher ranks till it is forced upon their notice by these powerful patrons. When the work of spiritual reorganization is completed, it is on them that its maintenance will principally depend, and so too their combined aid is necessary for its commencement. Having but little influence in political government, they are more likely to appreciate the need of a moral government the special object of which it will be to protect them against the oppressive action of the temporal power. In the third chapter, therefore, I shall explain the mode in which philosophers and working men will cooperate. Both have been prepared for this coalition by the general course which modern history has taken, and it offers now the only hope we have of really decisive action. We shall find that the efforts of positivism to regulate and develop the natural tendencies of the people make it, even from the intellectual point of view, more coherent and complete. But there is another and a more unexpected source from which positivism will obtain support, and not till then will its true character and the full extent of its constructive power be appreciated. 
I shall show in the fourth chapter how eminently calculated is the positive doctrine to raise and regulate the social condition of women. It is from the feminine aspect only that human life, whether individually or collectively considered, can really be comprehended as a whole. For the only basis on which a system really embracing all the requirements of life can be formed is the subordination of intellect to social feeling, a subordination which we find directly represented in the womanly type of character, whether regarded in its personal or social relations. Although these questions cannot be treated fully in the present work, I hope to convince my readers that positivism is more in accordance with the spontaneous tendencies of the people and of women than Catholicism, and is therefore better qualified to institute a spiritual power. It should be observed that the ground on which the support of both these classes is obtained is that positivism is the only system which can supersede the various subversive schemes that are growing every day more dangerous to all the relations of domestic and social life. Yet the tendency of the doctrine is to elevate the character of both of these classes, and it gives the most energetic sanction to all their legitimate aspirations. Thus it is that a philosophy originating in speculations of the most abstract character is found applicable not merely to every department of practical life, but also to the sphere of our moral nature. But to complete the proof of its universality, I have still to speak of yet another very essential feature. I shall show, in spite of prejudices which exist very naturally on this point, that positivism is eminently calculated to call the imaginative faculties into exercise. It is by these faculties that the unity of human nature is most distinctly represented. They are themselves intellectual, but their field lies principally in our moral nature, and the result of their operation is to influence the active powers. The subject of women treated in the fourth chapter will lead me by a natural transition to speak in the fifth of the aesthetic aspects of positivism. I shall attempt to show that the new doctrine by the very fact of embracing the whole range of human relations in the spirit of reality discloses the true theory of art, which has hitherto been so great a deficiency in our speculative conceptions. The principle of the theory is that, in coordinating the primary functions of humanity, positivism places the idealities of the poet midway between the ideas of the philosopher and the realities of the statesman. We see from this theory how it is that the poetical power of positivism cannot be manifested at present. We must wait until moral and mental regeneration has advanced far enough to awaken the sympathies which naturally belong to it, and on which art in its renewed state must depend for the future. The first mental and social shock once passed, poetry will at last take her proper rank. She will lead humanity onward towards a future which is now no longer vague and visionary while at the same time she enables us to pay due honor to all phases of the past. The great object which positivism sets before us individually and socially is the endeavor to become more perfect. The highest importance is attached therefore to the imaginative faculties because in every sphere which with they deal they stimulate the sense of perfection. Limited as my explanations in this work must be, I shall be able to show that positivism, while opening out a new and wide field for art, supplies in the same spontaneous way new means of expression. I shall thus have sketched with some detail the true character of the regenerating doctrine. All its principal aspects will have been considered. Beginning with its philosophical basis, I pass by natural transitions to its political purpose, thence to its action upon the people, its influence with women, and lastly, to its aesthetic power. In concluding this work, which is but the introduction to a larger treatise, I have only to speak of the conception which unites all these various aspects. As summed up in the positivist motto, love, order, progress, they lead us to the conception of humanity, which implicitly involves and gives new force to each of them. Rightly interpreting this conception, we view positivism at last as a complete and consistent whole. The subject will naturally lead us to speak in general terms of the future progress of social regeneration, as far as the history of the past enables us to foresee it. The movement originates in France and is limited at first to the great family of Western nations. I shall show that it will afterwards extend, in accordance with definite laws, to the rest of the white race, and finally to the other two great races of man. End of section zero.